Thank you very much, Dr. Huang, for this opportunity to present our work. I am excited to be here to share our experience on how modeling can be used to mitigate defects during additive manufacturing of metallic parts. The outline I have prepared is simple. I want to start by giving examples of specific defects in additively manufactured metallic parts so that we are all on the same page. Additive manufacturing can make parts that cannot be made by conventional processes. You see this aluminum silicon heat exchanger for jet engines with many intricate internal channels. These type of products cannot be made by casting or welding or joining. But we do not want any defects in the parts. So we want to focus how models can be helpful to avoid defects. Then some basic questions as to why we need models to reduce defects and what type of models can we build. I want to show how easy it is to build various types of models to reduce defects and give many examples of how models have been recently used to reduce various types of defects. Finally, a summary of what all these examples taken together mean and how we can make further progress together. Because everyone can contribute to modeling and this can reduce defects in part. Much of the work that I am going to be presenting was done by group members and collaborators and many of them are included in this list. These pictures may be familiar to many of you. Insufficient overlap between layers and hatches cause lack of fusion defects, which is very common in additive manufacturing. Rapid heating and cooling and their spatial variations result in stresses and strains and in many cases solidification cracks and other types of cracks may form. Here we see an extreme form of thermally induced stresses resulting in delamination. Also chemical composition of the parts may be different from the powders because of selective vaporization and loss of volatile alloying elements. Printed metal parts are also often not very smooth and roughness may be caused by a combination of process variables and the type of powder that we use. At very high scanning speeds, the deposited track may not be continuous and the track may break up into balls. I shall try to focus on the modeling of the top three defects in my precious 25 minutes. There are many good reasons why we want to use models to reduce defects. First, models would allow us to get values of parameters that are difficult to measure experimentally. An example would be a very high transient temperature that changes very rapidly. Also, models can reduce the total number of trial and error testing. This is important because the high cost of the feedstock materials and more important, the machines for additive manufacturing. So trial and error testing is very expensive for additive manufacturing. Also, models can tell us why defects are observed. So it gives us insight that we cannot get by any other way. Here is a quotation by Lord Kelvin. When you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. Models help us to do just that. It is important to select the right model. And here we classify them into three categories. First, back of the envelope models 
which include both the analytical and dimensional analysis based uh, models. And it's good to start here. And we will discuss several examples of these types of modeling. Next, mechanistic models based on physics. For these, physical processes must be well understood. When the mechanism is not well understood, but a reasonable volume of data are available, machine learning is a good choice. We will consider examples of both mechanistic models and machine learning. Here we consider what we need to build a back of the envelope calculation model for additive manufacturing. We need to know what variables are important for the process. We need to know the properties, specifically the thermophysical properties of the alloy that we are going to use as a feedstock. We need to know how to make the solution for the model. And also we need to understand the simplifying assumption so that we know the limitations of the model. There are two common approaches. One is called dimensional analysis, sometimes also called scaling analysis, based on the dimensions of the important variables. And second one is analytical solutions with simplifying assumptions, like the heat conduction model. So the solution methodology is based on the dimensions of the important variables, the testing of alternative correlations using data, and also for physics-based equations, analytical solutions and their assumptions. For back of the envelope calculations of lack of fusion, the important variables, their units and dimensions are listed in this table. Important variables include the laser power, scanning speed, layer thickness, hatch spacing, melt pool width, and other variables. The dimensions include the mass, the length, and the temperature. So if we have eight variables and three dimensions, there will be eight minus three equal to five non-dimensional pi terms. So combining these five variables, we can reduce them to maybe four pi terms, pi one, pi two, pi three, and pi four. And these four variables would be correlated using data. We will show that the porosity fraction phi will be related to this lambda by d layer thickness by the melt pool depth delta by w which is hatch spacing by width of the molten pool and then these variable in this figure the porosity fraction phi is correlated with lambda by d one variable delta by w another variable and the big variable in the denominator here what we see is that the data correlate well with this expression here in this figure. So this is our model, but the question we have to ask is that, remember, we had to plug in the values of melt pool width and melt pool depth. What if these values are not available? Then we will need another back of the envelope model to estimate these melt pool depth and melt pool width values. We have seen that the porosity fraction phi can be estimated from the values of all these seven other parameters. But the melt pool depth and melt pool width, they have to be available. That means we must do some experiments to get the values of these two parameters. Commonly, that is the case. But we can also estimate these values using another model. The model can be based on data or the model can be based on some simple analytical heat conduction model 
So we are going to look at that as to how we can obtain melt pool width and melt pool depth from the analytical solution of the heat conduction equation. The heat conduction equation is available in many textbooks. The boundary conditions and initial conditions for their solution, assuming a large plate, also commonly available and the solution is given here. Depends on the initial temperature, the thermophysical properties, and the location where we are measuring the temperature. So the temperature can be obtained in three-dimensional space. If we take this solidus temperature to define the fusion zone boundaries, we can get the melt pool dimensions as a function of scanning speed and laser power. What we see here is that in many cases, the solution that we obtain here can provide correct values of the melt pool dimensions if we simply use the heat conduction model solution. We reviewed that in order to develop a back of the envelope model for reducing lack of fusion, we needed the dimensions of the melt pool. We determined the melt pool dimensions from the heat conduction model in the previous slide. But there are also other alternatives. One of them is to determine the melt pool dimensions from dimensional analysis. So we review the variables that impact the melt pool dimensions, find their units and dimensions, and based on the number of variables and the number of dimensions, we find that there would be four pi terms, non-dimensional terms, that can be correlated. So in functional form, one of those parameters, pi 1, which represents the melt pool depth by the thickness of the layer, is a function of pi 2, pi 3, and pi 4 given here. So if we now try to fit the data into this equation, we find a functional form such as the one given here. So delta by the layer thickness is a function of QB by HM, which is the dimensionless heat input, TP, the peak temperature by the ambient temperature, and one upon square root of alpha by alpha naught, where alpha is the thermal diffusivity and alpha naught is the thermal diffusivity at a reference temperature. So these three parameters can give us the fusion zone depth by this expression. And the data seem to fit well for several materials for different conditions of experiment. We can use a non-dimensional equation like this to obtain the melt pool dimensions. A well-tested heat transfer and fluid flow model can calculate the fusion zone geometry in different hatches and layers. Unmelted region between the two consecutive tracks and layers, they indicate the lack of fusion defect. To make a fully dense part, there needs to be sufficient overlap among adjacent hatches and layers. For a given alloy, higher power and slow scanning will result in larger fusion zones and less lack of fusion defects. And just the opposite will also happen. That means if the power is low, and scanning speed is fast, then the fusion zone would be smaller in size and there is likely to be less overlap between adjacent hatches and between layers. For a given set of process variables, like it is given here, the thermophysical properties of the alloys determine the size of the fusion zone. 
And this is what we see here. In the case of stainless steel 316, the fusion zone size is smaller than aluminum silicon 10 magnesium alloy. And so in the case of stainless steel 316, for these processing conditions, there is going to be lack of fusion defects. And in the case of aluminum silicon 10 magnesium alloy, there is not going to be any lack of fusion defect. Defects are a big problem in additive manufacturing, particularly cracking. What are the important variables? Laser power, laser beam radius, scanning speed. There are a whole host of variables. I'm not going to read all of these, but I promise you, if you count all of these, you will get 12 important variables that can affect cracking. So if I wanted to do experiments by trial and error to avoid cracking, I will need to do, if I did a two-factor design of experiments, DOE in short, two-factor design of experiments will mandate 4,096 experiments. But if I uh, look at the non-dimensional numbers, I can bring these 12 variables down to only four. So we'll need 16 uh, experiments only instead of 4,100 experiments. How so? Think of the flow of a fluid through a pipe of circular cross sections. If you wanted to know the structure of the flow, laminar or turbulent, you will need to know the diameter of the pipe, the velocity of the fluid, the density, and the viscosity. So how many variables? Four variables. But someone who has studied fluid mechanics will say, I don't need four variables. I can use just the Reynolds number. If the Reynolds number is higher than 2,100, the structure of the flow is going to be turbulent. If the Reynolds number is five, it's going to be laminar flow. So it is like this here. If you know physics, you can mix physics with uh, database models. This is an example. How so? If we take these four variables, solidification stress, ratio of vulnerable to relaxation time, temperature gradient to solidification growth rate ratio and cooling rate, we can do a regression analysis to form a cracking susceptibility index. And a higher cracking susceptibility index is bad news. A lower value is safe. Uh, no cracks are observed. Again, we can do feature importance. The solidification stress sigma is the most important variable, followed by the other three, vulnerable time to relaxation time ratio, the temperature gradient to growth rate, and cooling rate. So we can do a lot with database model. Starting with a heat transfer and fluid flow model, we can do a lot of things that are otherwise difficult to do. Distortion and residual stress are important factors. We start with a transient heat transfer fluid flow model. We do the temperature calculations and we feed this into Abacus through a Python script we get the residual stress and distortion calculations done using very accurate transient three-dimensional temperature field. We can calculate the relative values of residual stresses for directed energy deposition gas metal arc, directed energy deposition laser, or powder bed fusion laser. Powder bed fusion laser has the smallest size of the fusion zone and the residual stresses are the lowest. Whereas for gas metal arc directed energy deposition, the residual stresses are larger. Also, we can check the relative values of residual stresses for different materials under different conditions. So those are some of the benefits of doing this model. It is not important to do a complex mechanistic model to understand the magnitude of the residual stress. So here we are uh, going back to the non-dimensional analysis. 
we are listing all the symbols here. So the dimensionless peak residual stress scaled with respect to the yield strength is related to six other variables that are listed here. Because there are a total seven variables with one dimension length, there will be six pi terms. And eventually, following the same procedure that we did for other cases, we can express the peak residual stress as a function of the other variable. And the data seem to follow the expression that is given by this equation. So non-dimensional analysis is very useful if you want to get a good feel for how much residual stress a part is going to have as a function of process variables. To sum up, we have looked at three types of modeling, back of the envelope simplified modeling, mechanistic modeling based on physics, and machine learning primarily based on data. These modeling techniques are a cost-effective solution to reduce the lack of fusion defects, cracking, and residual stress in additive manufacturing. Machine learning augmented with mechanistic modeling can reduce the number of variables and the volume of data needed for reducing cracking in additively manufactured parts. Our previous works show that modeling is also an important tool to address composition change, surface roughness, and balling. Finally, back of the envelope modeling, mechanistic modeling, and machine learning do not require expensive facilities and big laboratories, and it allows everyone, independent of affluence, national origin, and um, all other things that divide us, to contribute to additive manufacturing.